Welcome back to Reading Between the Lines with Tandaman. Today, I have none other than Russell Envy, the mayor of Portage Park from the Upland Metaverse. This is episode 18 of Reading Between the Lines. Russell, it's great to have you here with us. Thank you so much. Episode 18, that's one of my favorite numbers, so I will take it. Absolutely. Um, for the Upland community, Russell doesn't really need an introduction. Everyone really knows him. He creates some great content. He's the mayor of Portage Park. And today we have an honor to have an hour long conversation with Russell. Russell, why don't you give a brief introduction to people that don't know you um, and we'll take it from there. Sure. You know, first and foremost, I am a player of Upland. Uh, I, I care very much about uh, the health of my own account, make sure that all of my assets are protected. But uh, I'm also an advocate for uh, regular people in the game. You know, there are uh, stigmas, you could say, about players that have been playing for uh, a long time you know like we like to call them whales because they have like such large accounts and stuff like that um and we all know that some of the the early accounts or some of the um more well-known people maybe get some uh special uh attention if you will uh, but I am an advocate for the everyday person, you know, like I want whatever I can do, you can do or whatever you can do, I can do like I want a level playing field when it comes to Upland. And I am definitely not afraid to speak out um, or, or speak up for anybody, you know, like I was a pretty big change behind or I was a pretty big driving force behind the treasure hunting changes um and and stuff like that and getting a lot of these bots taken care of you know i've been a very big advocate of that i treasure hunt in upland every single day uh and this is just something that i care very much for so that's what i do first and foremost you know outside of that i am a upland moderator on the main upland server um so i i do that as well i'm also part of the upland broadcast network that, that you could call it so um they don't distribute my content but they will link a youtube video post in a blog article or um there was a movie night at san francisco movie night uh and that's like my biggest accomplishment in upland so far was there was a pop-up that said like hey in 10 minutes uh russell envy's doing this thing you know so uh, I, I have earned stuff like that, but, you know, I, I take it very much to heart that that is a, a privilege. That is not something that everybody gets to do. Uh, but first and foremost, I'm I'm just a player like everybody else and uh, trying to make their way in Upland. If, if you could request the Upland community, would you like to have that pop up created as an NFT, one of one NFT for yourself? Um, I'm actually working on, on stuff like this, where it is a, yeah, I, I mean, anything that anyone's going to create that I don't have to pay to mint, and then they're going to hand me an NFT. I am fine to do that all day long. Uh, however, I do plan on releasing some NFTs here soon, and that might be part of it. Absolutely. And Russell, let me, let me ask you a question straight away. How much money did you invest in Upland? Sure. So the the answer here is a very, very small amount. I like to always say none. Uh, I, I have not put USD into the game to buy property. I have not put USD into the game to buy cars or spark any of that. The only USD that I've ever put into the game was to buy uh, block explorers. Uh, when I first started, I wasn't happy with some of the explorers, especially when you're in like the lower tiers, uh, when you're like, you know, visitor, uplander, pro, I, I didn't like those. So the very first block explorer that you could buy was part of the UPX podcast. Uh, they had three explorers. So I bought all three of those and they were like 20 bucks or something. So uh, I did that. And then there was a Thanksgiving day explorer or a, a thanksgiving explorer sale where they had um a turkey gravy ladle they had like a turkey hat that you could wear and then they actually had like a a, a turkey itself wearing like a pilgrim hat 
Uh, so I bought all those and, you know, like maybe that came to like 150 bucks. So that's really like how much I've, I've only ever put into Upland was just for those block explorers. Everything else uh, has been paid for in game by treasure hunting. Absolutely. Um, so Russell, why don't you talk a little bit about your personal background in terms of your work experience, in terms of your education, where you live, what you've done before Upland? We'd love to know that. Sure. You know, uh, that's actually very interesting getting to know people outside of Upland because everybody has their uh, reputation that they're trying to to uphold or they, they want to be known for. But uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I have been working with WordPress websites for the last 17 years. Uh, I started, it was 2009, 2008, somewhere around there. Um, it was, it, it's an open source project, right? Anybody can work on it. Anybody can contribute to it. Anybody can download it and make their own version of it if they will. So I've always been um, open to stuff like that. You know, my space was pretty big for me where you could have a social profile, but you could program it to add your own background or not program it, but you could style it, right? You could add your own background. You could add your own images, stuff like that. Uh, MySpace really kicked that off for me, but WordPress came along. Um, I had a WordPress website that taught people how to pimp their MySpace profiles. Did you have MySpace? I had High Five and Orchid. I didn't have okay. MySpace. Okay. Um, so MySpace was was pretty unique. But so I had a WordPress website that taught people how to uh like enhance their their MySpace. And then when MySpace went away, um, I still knew this WordPress stuff and I, I kind of just transitioned over to there. Um, you know, WordPress has done a lot for me. I have a somewhat reputation in the community. I've spoken at over 200 different conferences about different topics on WordPress. You can find a lot of that kind of stuff on either wordpress.tv or you can go to uh, YouTube and, and look up uh, WordPress Russell. I'm like one of the only people named Russell in the WordPress community. So all my videos really come up. Uh, I used to be on the podcast. We, I did that for like five, six years. You know, every Friday we would talk about something related. Uh, I did that pretty heavily and I've just, I've been doing that. That's what I do behind the scenes. You know, like I'll treasure hunt and then whether I win or lose, I'm right back to, you know, rebuilding someone's website or installing a shopping cart plugin or, you know, like, like something along those lines. So you know, that's what I'm very passionate about. And uh, that's what I got my education in. Um, I grew up in uh, Nevada. I was born in northern Nevada, but then I moved to southern Nevada, which would be Las Vegas. And uh, I, I had college credits. There's a thing where when you graduate high school, if you have a certain uh, GPA, they gave you, it was $10,000 towards going to college. I used all of that $10,000 credit to my advantage, but it really uh, wasn't for me. You know, like traditional college really wasn't for me in, in that sense. I already did 12, 13 years of, of elementary, middle, high school. I didn't want to dedicate another four or five years to to go to, to college. And then again, having all that debt, right, where we see a lot of people, not just Americans, but a lot of people went to university and they just they can't pay back their loans. Uh, I didn't want to do that. So I went to the University of YouTube. I applied. They accepted me. You know, they didn't write me a, a letter saying you're accepted. You basically just create an account and and there you are. But um, I am one of the biggest advocates that you can learn anything that you want and it's all available on YouTube. You know, if you want to learn to play Upland, that's there. If you want to learn how to, uh, or if you want to learn crypto and then learn how to trade, learn how to margin invest, all that stuff, you can do everything on YouTube. And what's really cool is you have people like yourself, like myself, who are willing to sit down on a YouTube channel and explain this, you know, like... 
you don't usually get that unless you pay for something, right? Like you have to pay to go to university to sit there and listen to this professor lecture or whatever. But I've always found that experience is better than, you know, sitting through a lecture. So I like to listen to people that are doing things and they're doing it in real time. And I don't want to listen to somebody who did this, you know, 10 years ago. And and they're not current because things, as we know now, they continue to change. And not only that, they're changing at a faster pace than I think we they ever have. Um, and so that's very important to not only stay current, you know, to 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 keep your business going or um just to keep your livelihood going. Uh, but as the world changes, you know, like you have to keep up with it. So I found that YouTube, the university of YouTube. I don't even know what the mascot would be. You know, like like when you uh, w- when you have universities, some of them have like a fighting Irish, some of them have a bulldog. I would like to know what the maybe it's a camera. Maybe his name's like Cammy the camera or, or something like that. I I don't know, but uh, University of YouTube is is uh, where you know I I learned a lot of this stuff. Absolutely. Um, so since you talked quite a lot about WordPress and your time and the fact that you're a significantly senior member within the Upland, within the WordPress community, um, let me ask you this question. Do you think we're going to see something such as WordPress for 3D websites? For For 3D websites? Yeah. You know, I've seen things built on top of WordPress already. So um, like when I lived in Las Vegas, I worked for a casino. Uh, And so their website was built on WordPress. And then we built their we built an application for them, like a, a, a phone app, Android, iOS. You know, we built that through WordPress. Uh, we actually had a, a, a game that you could play. So like when you checked into the hotel, um, on the app, there was like a game. It was like a little slot machine. And then if you if you pulled uh, or if you won, like you got three sevens on the slot machine, you got like a free dinner at the steakhouse or you got like a free day at the cabana. So, I mean, like I've built tons of things like that. And, you know, WordPress integrates into a lot of things because at the end of the day, uh, WordPress is mostly PHP and JavaScript. And, you know, like JavaScript, you can do anything with JavaScript. Um, and now that WordPress has really opened up, they have their own API. They can pull API data in. It's gotten a lot, a lot easier. But I've seen WordPress do crazy things. So I guarantee that there's already somebody out there working on 3D WordPress. And I guarantee you that uh, there's all al- like there's already a few people in the WordPress community, or I'm sorry, in the Upland community, like Upland Guide. He's on WordPress, and you, you know stuff like that. Uh, Upland uh, which is a a great website that that shows you the cheapest or the fastest route in Upland, like to to get from one city or another. That's built on top of WordPress. So I mean, definitely we're we're going to see that. Absolutely. Um, in the beginning of your introduction, you talked a little bit about older players and the fact that the community thinks that they're reals. So yeah. let, me, let me ask you a question, um, and I'd love your answer on this. Are you a whale? Am I a whale? Um, not in the traditional sense. Not in the sense where, you know, I'm, I'm dead... I'm definitely not like uh, some of the top players that have put, you know, easily, easily ten, fifteen thousand dollars into this. You know, like uh, there's a few Upland YouTube personalities. You know, they've put over twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars into this, uh, which is very interesting. I'm not a whale in that sense. Uh, where, where I would say. I'm a whale would be through treasure hunting and through spark, you know, and I also don't have the most spark, but I'm pretty up there. Um, I'm definitely in a high percentage of, of all of that, but I wouldn't say I'm a, I'm a whale. Like you wouldn't call my profile a whale. It's only worth 10 million or 10 million epics. So that's $10,000. But, um, you know, like when it comes to treasure hunting, when it comes to spark hunts, when it comes to, 
certain things like you mentioned that I am known for in uh, in Upland. Maybe I'm a whale in that sense. Absolutely. If you like the video, please hit the like button. If you think what's being discussed is nice and you'd like to join the discussion, please comment below. And if you'd like to stay updated, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. Um, so let me let's let's talk about your upland journey, Russell. Um, sure. How did you find upland? When did you find upland? If you could talk us through. Um. Yeah. So I have a YouTube channel, and on my YouTube channel, I have a video. It was it's my one year anniversary video. Uh, I would strongly encourage everybody to go uh, watch that, not only to to learn from my mistakes, but uh, th there's a lot of good information in there. But I started through the Brave browser playing Upland. That's how I was introduced. I created a profile. And at the time, there was only three cities that you could uh, be in. You could be in San Francisco, Manhattan, or Fresno. So I started in Fresno. And... That's where my journey started. And I started playing in, in early 2021. My profile kind of sat uh, dormant for a while. Like I didn't know what to do, right? Like uh, we have great tools now like UPX land and UPX world and uh, the Upland optimizer and uh, UPX spark exchange and stuff like that. We didn't have those when I started. So I didn't understand like how you would properly list a property for sale. I didn't know what FSA was. I didn't know that because I was a visitor, I could buy FSA property. And, you know, at the time you could buy properties in Fresno for 550 epics, which is almost nothing, you know, like 550 epics. I think you're going to make the entire viewers jealous of that. Russell, everyone. Well, well, I mean, like, like you know, I'm definitely jealous of, of of a few people that got to do some things, but I've definitely, you know, I, I've I minted a, a few in Fresno for like 550. I've minted a few for like 880, you know, but even then, like I minted a, a couple collections, like I had the Woodward Park collection. I minted those for like maybe uh 4000 epics all together and then i sold them for like over 100 each you know so i put uh well i earned $3 of or 3000 epics treasure hunting and then i turned that into 300,000 just by selling that collection so that that was one of the very first things that i started doing you know was like jumping on discord learning from people watching some youtube videos and then like once i started treasure hunting and I just started seeing that UPX number go up, like no matter what I did, uh, I really got addicted to Upland through treasure hunting. And then when I saw that you could move from, you know, Fresno is a very small city. It doesn't pay out very much in treasure hunting, but it was a great city to learn. But then I went to San Francisco where like all the big payouts were happening. And that's where like the majority of my, my, you know, status in the game came from was uh, treasure hunting all those exclusives in San Francisco. Absolutely. Also, you have a rare block explorer collection, Russell. Why don't you talk us through that? Uh, I didn't know that this was a thing, you know, like when I started, uh, there was a, a sale in the UPX store and it was the UPX podcast collection. Um, I didn't know that at the time, but there is the 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 microphone. Uh, so it actually says UPX podcast 2021, and it's got like a it's got like a microphone like this. <laughs> um, and there's that, and then there's the the turtle T U R D L E, and then there's uh, another block explorer called uh, T Bag. So all three of those are part of the uh, UPX podcast collection. So when those came out, uh, those were the first three block explorers that I, I purchased. Um, and it wasn't until I did the UPX podcast, I was on an episode of that podcast talking about treasure hunting. And I brought this up to thank me later. You know, thank me later is pretty well known in the Upland community. Uh, he's the mastermind behind UPX podcast. 
uh i'm sorry upx world upx world uh I was on an episode of that and I said, Hey, by the way, I have this collection and uh, thank me later said, you know, they don't even have that. They are the UPX podcast. They don't even have all three of those block explorers. And so like on that episode, uh, thank me later said, I will give you a thousand dollars USD. If you sell me all three of those block explorers. <laughs> Uh, that's when I realized that I had something kind of special, but I didn't even know that that was a thing. Um, shortly after that, then I started looking into different block explorer collections and there's actually quite a few out there, but that is one of the rare ones. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so you started Upland when you joined Upland in January, 2021, you started playing Upland regularly around March of 2021. Um, talk me through what's going on in the mind of Russell, right? Because uh, the world is coming out of this global disease of 2020, which we can't name due to YouTube policy. Um, and you're, you have the conviction to put your money um, on something that may or may not succeed, right? So what are you thinking? What's your thought pattern? Uh, or well, you didn't uh, put that much money but you did buy some block explorers so um what's what's going on in your mind there talk to talk to me about that please yeah sure you know um i would i was in las vegas nevada when all of that started and um you know there we may never know answers to certain things but uh early early on uh, our entire staff at the casino that I worked for got really, really sick. And uh, it was nothing that I ever experienced. You know, like I've been sick before, but like nothing like this where it actually like put me down for a few days. Like it was hard to get out of bed, stuff like that. Um, and then once um, announcements were made of like what was happening, what was occurring in the world, you know, stuff like that. It started to make like a little bit of sense. Uh, but that was really, you know, the, the casino that I worked at, there was people that worked there for 45, 50 years, you know, like they had pensions. That was their, that was what they did. They worked hard for 40 years and they were looking to get that casino pension or something, um, and when when all of that happened, you know, like everybody in Las Vegas basically lost their job, like the entire city shut down. Uh, but a lot of people got furloughed, including myself, you know, like I wasn't fired. I just wasn't getting paid um, and stuff like that. But then a lot of places had to start making decisions and a lot of people started losing jobs. And that's mainly one of the reasons why I just don't put money into the game of Upland is, you know, like I just bought a house for my family. I've got two kids. My wife and I have goals outside of the game. And, you know, like before all of that happened, I had a much different life. I had a, a pretty sweet life going for me um, where I was traveling a lot. You know, I, I'm a big fan of auto racing. Um, anything with a motor really I'll watch, you know, boat racing, plane racing. I, I'm, I'm all into it, but, uh, you know, that's where I, I used to spend a lot of my money, but now, you know, things are completely different for everybody. And I still maintain that you don't have to put money into the game. It's much harder now than it was with, you know, the treasure hunting changes and stuff like that. But, uh, I saw an opportunity in Upland, you know, where there was a every couple of hours, there was a notification that came across that said that there was a treasure hunt, you know, and I was finding these treasures and, you know, I'd get 30,000 epics for 30 seconds worth of work, you know, or like my, my the most epics that I've brought in was 289,000 epics. You know, I got that off of one pinata, which was pretty cool. Um, and when once I saw that, I was just like, there's no need to put money into this, you know, like some people don't want a treasure hunt or they've tried and maybe they don't understand it. I guess I'm just fortunate enough that I understand it and I happen to be pretty good at it. And then I just started writing the book on how to do it, you know, like um, until 
until I really released my own video, you know, like my strategy was, uh, was my own. And now I think a lot of people use my treasure hunting strategy or they definitely just use my tips. Like that's for sure. But, uh, you know, like that's really just how I grew into my own playing upwind, which is, you know, not putting money into it, figuring out either, okay, I've got this property. I can trade for it. I either want to make a profit on it or I'll trade it for something of value that's going to earn me a high yield. Um, and then that word is very important, by the way, yield. Um, Cause I was spending a lot of money and I was buying all of these properties, but they didn't have a high yield. Right. So I've got some great stuff in San Francisco, but it doesn't earn me very much a month. You know, it wasn't really until Chicago and LA came out in the game. That's where I really started putting all my UPX to work. And, you know, like that's when I understood the game where we are today, you know, like that's when I just really started accelerating, you know, like I earn UPX by treasure hunting. And then I take that UPX and I, I go and I buy a property that has a high yield in LA. And then, you know, now I'm making a hundred dollars a month just in yield. If I stopped treasure hunting and I just didn't do anything, I'll still have a hundred thousand UPX every month that it's just coming into the game or coming into my profile from yield. And, you know, that was very interesting to think about the game in that way. Uh, but it's definitely now that treasure hunting changes are here, it's helped, you know, because not putting money into the game, earning yield, earning you know, money through treasure hunting that has sustained me. And, you know, it, it still keeps me going today. Like I built my profile off of that. Absolutely. Um, so you're the mayor of Portage Park Note. What's yeah. Portage Park Note? You know, we're still trying to figure that out. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, when, when Spark came into the game, there was a way to start building, right? Like for for those of your followers who maybe aren't familiar with Upland, you know, like we didn't have Spark when I started. You couldn't build uh, buildings. There was none of that. You could treasure hunt, you could buy, you could sell properties. That's it. You know, like you could trade block explorers, Um that was that was pretty easy to do but i mean like we were very very limited in the early days when i first started playing so you know when spark came out and when buildings came out that was a real big game changer for a lot of people now there had already been nodes or the concept of nodes they were already created at that point through like midtown terrace and stuff like that um but I was part of a construction company. It was called the Kiwi Construction Company. And somebody there was, you know, like they were making deals where they would um, build a building for somebody in exchange for UPX. And then they would pay everybody to rent Spark to build that building, right? Like that's what we see today in the game. If you want to build a building, you can go to an exchange and you can pay UPX to rent people Spark and to build your building. I was in a server. It was called the Kiwi server, Kiwi Construction Company. And somebody advertised this thing called Portage Park. And it just said like, hey, we're this new idea. We're this new startup. Check this out. So I happened to start talking to somebody. And they said, yeah, you know, like Chicago uh, just came out. There's this little arguably there's this area of Chicago where there's just not a lot of attention uh, of where there's properties being minted. You know, everybody, when Chicago first came out, it started in the center and then it started expanding. And then, you know, like you had people building treasure hunting webs. So some people had Portage Park properties even before Portage Park was the node that you know now, but it really started for me, when I read that discord announcement, there's, there's this thing starting. And, you know, when I joined Portage Park, there was a lot to mint out and they were very, very cheap properties. You know, they were like two, three, four thousand epics. 
um, not very much. So, you know, I would for a week long, I would treasure hunt in San Francisco and I would earn um, like at my, at my lowest, I think the lowest I earned was like a hundred dollars a month treasure hunting. So a hundred thousand epics a month. Uh, but I was taking that money and flying to Chicago and buying as many Portage Park properties <laughs> as I could. Uh, I didn't realize that it was going to be what it is now. Uh, but they had a vision, you know. So Portage Park is a community first and foremost. Uh, we all have one thing in common, which is that in the metaverse known as Upland, we all own properties in this border of Chicago, which is called Portage Park. And uh, from there, you know, we have a way that, of, of doing things, but we are a community that likes to win competitions. We like to build things and, and move together as one. And that's what really attracted me to Portage Park was that they are not a for-profit business in the sense that like, you know, every dollar that goes in the Portage Park, it's not going into my pocket or it's not going into the server admin's pockets. What I learned early on was that the four people that manage the Portage Park discord every dollar that comes in whether it's an nft sell or there's a competition or whatever that money goes right back to the players um so we can talk about that in a little bit more because we just had um a pretty big thing happen in portage park but all of the money um that people can earn or that like, you know, we do spark giveaways once a week. We have a thing where, you know, we put people's names into a, a drawing and you could win uh three spark for seven days, you know, and like, <clears throat> that's my spark. I donate three spark or uh city runner, MRFR, whoever they are um, in the Portage park, you know, they donate their spark as a prize or, I will treasure hunt for a week and whatever I earn in that week is what I'll give away as a prize. Right. So like I gave away 42,000 epics one week. Um, I let people rent 10 spark from me. I mean, it's community driven at its, at its best really, you know um, it's not a, a pump and dump, if you will. It's not like, um, hey, we have this thing come buy all these properties. And then once the property value goes up, I would cash out and be done, you know, like we've seen a lot of nodes do that, which suck. Uh, but Portage Park is definitely not that, you know, we are community driven first and foremost. Absolutely. If you like the video, please hit the like button. If you think what's being discussed is nice and you'd like to join the discussion, please comment below. And if you'd like to stay updated, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. Um, so let me move on to the next section, Russell. And um, let me ask you this question. Why do you think Upland will succeed? Why do I think Upland will succeed? I think they're doing a lot of things right, but it wasn't until UPX World, the new version of UPX World came out, and that Layer 2 product showed me that there's going to be a lot of incorporation with Upland, right? So I was on board with a lot of uh, players early on. Like there's no utility for buildings. There's no utility for Spark. There's no utility for this and that. But, you know, now we're seeing Layer 2s being built, right? Someone's building a Layer 2 casino. Someone has the UPX world. You know, now we have a uh, world of soccer that's being built on top of Upland and stuff like that. You know, like I think Upland's going to succeed because they are going to be a, a great base layer. They're going to be a great true layer one. And then, you know, we've already seen so many great layer twos come out and I, I can't wait to see what the future is going to be, you know, but I think because people like you and I can program these things. We can interact with the API. We can pull data that we want from Upland to build our world. It's going to succeed purely because of that, because anybody can apply for the developer network, right? 
not everybody gets approved, but once you get approved, you know, the, the sky's the limit on what you can build. And we're, we're seeing a lot of really cool things with that, you know, Creed more. Well, UPX world just had a, uh, a racing venture in the Creed more node, right? They, they did a completely 100% away from Upland it was all organized by people not part of Upland. It all went to charity. There was auctions. There was great things. But um, they took Upland assets and built it into the UPX world and built like a whole racing thing for a whole weekend. And just because of that, you know, it just shows that these things can really thrive. So, you know, everybody wants in-game communication. Everybody wants these different things that Upland keeps promising. I actually can't wait to see what comes in Upland that's not part of the Upland development. Or I want to see what Thank Me Later builds in the next year. You know, like they're they're doing fantastic stuff. So I think they're going to succeed because of that. Absolutely. Um, I I'm on board with your comment on Upland Developer Network. However, here's the question to you. Do you think the basic Upland REST APIs, at least the one that is incoming, right? When you're calling the data from a REST API, should that version be open source for everyone to read? Because perhaps you have data on mint prices or, or any of the other things, right? Should that be open source without the ability to get approved? Okay, you wanna create something and add that to Upland, Perhaps that should be on an approval basis, but getting uh, common knowledge data, such as what are the mint prices, who owns it, stuff like that, should that be open source for your experience? You know, there's a lot of things that I would like to see as far as the API change for a few reasons. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that I was a very big advocate for um, the treasure hunting changes that happened, you know, and uh, one of the things that I suggested early on was that, you know, there are API endpoints in the game that you can physically see. So like when you treasure hunt or just like right now in the game, if you're following along on YouTube, uh, open up the Upland app and then go to the three little dots in the bottom and then click on treasure. And then whatever city you're in, you can treasure hunt there. And at the very top of it, it tells you how many people are treasure hunting, right? And it never shows you more than six. There could be a hundred people treasure hunting, but you don't know who all of the hundred people are. It only shows you six. So I think, you know, like that API endpoint, um, I have that saved, by the way, like I, I can show that. So I can actually pull that up in a, in a browser. I can actually hit that endpoint and I can see the same data. So like if I'm looking at San Francisco and it shows me the three or I'm sorry, the six people, um, when I go hit the a API endpoint, it shows me those six people. But my argument is that especially when we were trying to change treasure hunting you know i was catching people who don't have a property in a city they are brand new accounts basically what people were doing early on was because riot mode is a thing in treasure hunting which doubles the prize um people were creating all of these accounts just to turn on treasure hunting to get that threshold over to turn on riot mode, you know, which I see as stealing, you know, like if naturally 50 people are treasure hunting in the game and riot mode kicks on because of that. Great. But artificially turning it on by creating a hundred accounts and then just turning them all on in order to boost that number I've always seen that as stealing. And my argument was that for the API, I want to see all the names. If it says 75 people are hunting, I want to see 75 names. I want to see who's all there. And I want to be able to capture a screenshot of it or a snapshot. And then we can review and we can see what's happening. And it turns out that that turned to be a very good thing because that's how we caught a lot of people. So yes, you know, I think a lot of things should be made open source. And I do think that some of this data um, should be made open, but a lot of the 
a lot of the stuff that we're seeing, you know, I trust not everybody needs to see, right? Like not everybody needs to pull certain data. Uh, but I do think that some data sets should be just um, wildly available. And, and some of it is, and it continues to grow. But yeah, I would like to see a lot more. Um, but with great power comes great responsibility. And, you know, security is a big thing and not having too many people hitting those endpoints or not having too many people approved to do things, you know, Upland's controlling that. And, you know, maybe that's a good thing. There's always a bigger part of the story, right? From where we play. Yeah. I could sit here all day long and say, I want this, I want that or whatever, but I don't know the technical insides of, of the game, or I don't know the development standpoint or where they are, but I think what we have now is great. I'd like to see a little bit more transparency as far as, you know, active players, you know, I'd like to hit an endpoint that says like right now in the game, there are 553,000 people logged in. And of that, here's how many people are treasure hunting. Here's how many people have done sends. I'd like to see stuff like that, but you know, all in due time, you know? Absolutely. So here's a divisive question, Russell. We recently know that UIP one vote took place, right? This divided the community right in the middle, in the center. There were true believers of Upland who were against the vote. There were people who are new players that were for the vote. And there were also true believers that were for the vote, right? Um, so there was a lot of divisive um, debates and everyone had their own opinions on this. What's your opinion on UIP1? Yeah, great question. You know, um... <clears throat> The 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 upland initial proposal or something like that, uh UIP one, you know, um basically that was to change a mechanic of the game of how UPX is distributed or how the, the flow of UPX changes. Um and that was based on the white paper. Now I don't invest in a cryptocurrency like Ethereum or Bitcoin or something like that. I don't invest anything until I read the white paper and I see if I agree with the project, you know, like when I read the energy web white paper, um, I was completely on board. You know, when I read the white paper on polka dot, um, I was on board, not only because polka dot is a great chain. Um, the person who built the polka dot blockchain built arguably one of the most important parts of the Ethereum blockchain, which is the uh, Ethereum virtual server. So I like to read the white paper to see if this is something I believe in. And when I read the Upland white paper, it made sense to me. I liked what they were doing. I, some of the formula stuff I didn't quite understand at first. I know better now. Um, but like when I read the white paper, I agreed with it. But in that white paper, it says that whenever we need more UPX, Upland will mint it. They won't borrow it from the community. They won't change the mechanic. They said flat out, this is what we're going to do. And I kind of wanted Upland to stick to that, you know, like. I don't know the complete insides to it, but I want to say that, you know, arguably maybe they never did that where, you know, they never introduced more UPX, whatever the supply is now, it's been the same supply since the game started. They need more UPX. I think we should have made Upland do what they wrote down in the white paper. And at least we should have made them do it two or three times to see if it was right. You know, like I, I definitely was a big no, you know, I was very vocal about it. I didn't want the change to happen because, you know, my, my fear is now that they're getting paid consistently monthly and they're pulling some of that money out for the development you know, instead of them having the money to do something, they're getting the money from us. So now we are investors is how I see it. All the money that I put in goes into their pocket and then UPX is going to go into the UPX land pool. Like how is, how am I not an investor at this point? You know what I mean? Like if we know that we weren't investors before that was made very clear by the community mods on Twitter, 
that we're not investors. We shouldn't see ourselves as investors. But now, now that a hundred percent of the money goes into the community pool, and then that community pool gets siphoned once a month for a stupid amount of UPX and it goes towards the development of the game. I'm 1000% on board that we are investors now. So, you know, that change happened. We haven't seen like nothing really has changed so far. We, you know, we'll see in the upcoming months if things have gotten different, but you know, I was, I was a big no for that. I really wanted to see, I really wanted Upland to carry out, what they proposed and I wanted to see it play, you know, um, is it good that they changed only time will tell, you know, I definitely don't want them to do it if it's broken, but they weren't pitching it as, Hey, this is broken. We need to fix it. They were pitching it as, Hey, it'd be really cool if we could do this. And, you know, like wants versus needs. And I didn't feel like we needed to do that. They wanted to do that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. If you like the video, please hit the like button. If you think what's being discussed is nice and you'd like to join the discussion, please comment below. And if you'd like to stay updated, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. Um, one of the community members, Heavenly Bells, his argument against the UIP1 was the same argument that Satoshi Nakamoto uh, talked about in his Bitcoin white paper. So the reason why Bitcoin has proof of work is to combat double spend, right? Yeah. So you don't get to spend the same dollar twice. If yeah. Heavenly Bills' argument is to be considered, this new UIP1 change would facilitate double spend. Do you think that is correct? You know, I listen to, to I listen to Heavenly talk. So there was a open community conversation where um you could join and you could actually ask a question to Adon, Dirk, and General Mort, right? And that's on YouTube. Uh, maybe we can link to that um in the description below. Absolutely. Um but but Heavenly was one of the first people to ask the question. And, you know, he was trying to, to get answers and everything that he was asking, nobody had an answer for. Nobody at least, you know, could provide an answer. Everything was kind of iffy, you know, like, I really can't answer that because of this, this, and this. And instead of a yes or no, it was always like a, um, a, a, a tiptoe kind of answer. And I get where both sides were. Um, but I, I tend to agree with that, that um, premise of, you know, I put $5 of my own USD into the game. That goes to Upland. In exchange for that, Upland gives me 5,000 Upix, and it sits in my wallet. Now, it stays in my wallet until I spend it. Once I spend it, it goes into the community pool. So once I spend it, it's no longer my money. Now it's just community funds. But however, that 5,000 Upix wouldn't be in that pool if I didn't put $5 into the game. So I kind of do see it as a double spend where I put money into the game. You gave me 5,000 Upix. I play around in the world, whatever. But that 5,000 Upix is going to get back to the UPX pool where somebody again pays $5 to get 5,000 Upix for. So it's circulating. I kind of see that premise where it's a, a double spend. I don't want to fully say I'm, I'm one way or another. I'd like to do a little bit more research, but I do feel that it's not far fetched to say that that's a, 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 a thing, you know, like if you play that, um, example that I just said back, it's exactly how it works and it's exactly how it, it was pitched. And a lot of people feel that way, you know, and that's exactly why I wanted to see Upland put more UPX into the pool. They said in their white paper, this is what we're going to do. Great, do it. But they didn't do it. They're recirculating the UPX. I've heard a lot of smart people argue this, but 
you know, I'm 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 kind of on that board where I I was no, I voted no for sure. Absolutely. Um, moving on, should Spark be celibate? Because we see a lot of players who, for whatever reason, have left Upland, but they still have significant amount of Spark. Now, some some of them rent out the Spark for dollars. Most of the time, the transaction happens outside of Upland. Um, however. Should they be allowed to sell their spark? Yeah, you know, I would I would love to see a way that somebody can purchase more spark outside of the upland store, right? That's the only way to purchase spark is when it comes on sale during spark week. You can earn spark treasure hunting, standard hunting, you know, stuff like that. Um, all the more reason why you should treasure hunt in the metaverse, you know, not only to bring in a passive income, um, but Spark is that passive income. You know, I have 23 Spark or 24 Spark, something like that. All free, by the way. I've never paid a single dime for any of my Spark. Everything was treasure hunting. And um, Spark came out on my birthday. It came out on October 6th of 2021. Um, which is pretty cool. We just celebrated the one year anniversary of being able to treasure hunt for Spark in Upland. Um, you know, and I, I've always seen it as a utility, but that's actually goes back to why I was advocating for treasure hunting changes because this was a thing that people were doing. And I don't know if many people know that, but there were people that were taking accounts. They were creating these accounts. They were treasure hunting and getting them up to Uplander status. And then they would go and get one or two spark to the account. And then they were selling the entire account. The email, the password, the login, and everything that the account owned. People were doing that, you know? So if you were new to the game and, you know, you could give somebody 500 bucks and you could inherit a profile that already had a good starting point, you know, people were doing that. And that was my argument of why treasure hunting changes needed to happen. You know, you should have to be verified to earn this thing because it is a sellable product. It is something that people want in the game, right? They covet it. And yes, I do think that if I choose to give my 24 spark away to somebody, like if I want to completely cash out of the game, I earn that spark. That spark is mine. I should physically be able to sell it. And, you know, without having to give up the keys, my email address and my password, uh, in order to do so. Yes, I, I do think that you should be able to to do that. You know, I think you should have to sell it in the same fragments. Like you shouldn't be able to sell a dumb number, but you know, like 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, you know, like those are all solid numbers, you know, or maybe even sell it in tenths. That's fine. But, uh, you know, I, I think that everything in the game should be tradable, whether it's spark or cars or buildings or land, like everything shouldn't. And, you know, maybe spark will one day. It just, it doesn't now, but yes, I, I do think that that is a thing. It should be a thing. Absolutely. Um, moving on to your personal uh, experience with Portage Park. Let me ask you this question that a lot of people uh, would have. Why did you run for mayor? <laughs> yeah you know um i mean why not no um <clears throat> so governance in upland is now a thing right we ha we have it it's not where it needs to be yet but it's coming right um we've had two votes so far right the first one was that test vote to name the block explorer for introducing voting and then we had UIP one. So governance is coming. However, um, Portage Park has been a leader in the governance space. So, you know, Portage Park was the first to introduce a a counselor or a a panel, if you will, of 
dedicated people to help do the day-to-day tasks in Portage Park. So I was, I ran for office then. I was one of the, there was three counselors. I was one of the first three. Um, so I, I have that honor. And then um, I ran a second term and I got uh, uh, elected again. So I became the first two-time elected counselor of Portage Park. Um, and that, you know, on top of my videos, on top of my YouTube, on top of my Twitter, I've built a lot of trust um, and I've, I've, I've continued to show my sources, right? Like there's some people that make claims and they don't want to share their sources to maybe burn a bridge or, you know, maybe lose that source or whatever. Um, but for me, it's very important to show my sources. And when I say this is happening, I need to be able to prove it or else, you know, if you say that one too many times and you can't back it up, um, you lose a lot of trust in this game and in Upland trust is more important than spark. I would argue, you know, like, especially when it comes to trading properties and, and, you know, like building a community with people like you, you really need that trust. Um, but so I, I ran for office because that was the thing that you could do. But then, you know, we saw the Upland players, UPL, the Upland players League? lobby. I, I, le- no, no. Hang on. It's uh, I have it on Discord. Hang on one second. We'll look here. It is called the where to go. The UMPC, the Upland Metaverse Players Council. Okay, so, um, you know, that started nine months after Portage Park already set up a, the the counselors. And when they were setting up a player council, you know, they came to me. I volunteered, but they came to me and they picked a lot of our brain of what we did in Portage Park, how things were set up as far as the hierarchy of, you know, it's not really a who's in charge kind of a thing. Um, but there are, um, there is an order of like the server admins, the mayor, the counselors, the players, you know, so on and so forth. There, there is that, uh, for lack of better word, uh, a, a order. Um, but when the position of mayor came up, um, that was something that we talked about for a long time. And when I read what the definition of the mayor was to do, you know, like it, it's me to a T, you know, first and foremost, the mayor is responsible of, of bringing more eyes to Portage park and to be getting our name out there. And, you know, I could argue right now on this podcast, I'm literally doing that. Anybody who is part of your Twitter channel that is not part of Portage park, this is me introducing you to Portage park and I'm, I'm fulfilling my duties. That was really easy to do. Um, but not only that, you know, like, um, we we continue to build in Portage Park, you know, and part of that has helped us win the Halloween competition. Not a lot of people know that we won that twice. We won the very first Halloween decoration contest, and then we won it this year, you know, and, and that's done by strong leadership. And so anytime that there's a chance in Portage Park where I can be of leadership or I can be of um, the discussion to improve, I, I'm always going to do that, you know? So that's personally where it came from. Um, but running for mayor was, was, you know, another thing I wanted to do because I had quite a bit of UPX to spend, you know? So I was buying advertising on different servers and I was sending UPX and I was like, I ran a full campaign, even though it wasn't needed, I still did it, you know? Um, but I, I want to improve Portage Park. I have some ideas. And now that I am the the chair of Portage Park, right? Like the the buck stops with me, basically. Um, I I have a, a new sense of duty in the game to make sure that everybody's heard and that we're moving in the right direction. And and that's also um who I am as as a person, you know, like I teach people how to build WordPress sites. Um, I ran a meetup group in Las Vegas for 10 years and once a month for two hours, I'd get in front of a a group of people and I would teach them 
how to do something in WordPress for free. You know, like I could have arguably charged money for that, but I built a following doing something and I'm going to continue to do that in Upland and, and Portage Park is a great way to do that. Absolutely. If you like the video, please hit the like button. If you think what's being discussed is nice and you'd like to join the discussion, please comment below. And if you'd like to stay updated, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. Um, so let me let me ask you the next question. Why is Chicago not a tier one 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 city? I really don't care about the tier structure anymore. Um, I used to care very much and, you know, like it still, it still busts my, my behind that I don't have more Manhattan properties than I do. Um, however, you know, like whether it's a tier one, one, one or a one, one, two or whatever, it's, it's still a tier one. Um, it doesn't, uh, output a different payout if you do a standard hunt. Um, it still produces the same amount of spark, whether you win it as the other tier one. So I don't care that it, it's a one, one, two or a one, one, three, like it doesn't really matter. Um, I think where stuff like that is going to matter, um, is when like, there's a lot of cities in the game and not only just us cities, but there's more of an international. I thought Rio was going to be a tier one to be, to, to be honest with you. It's arguably one of the biggest cities in South America you would think that it's going to be a tier one and it's, it, it's a tier three, you know, um, Las Vegas. I thought arguably Las Vegas should be a tier three or a tier two. And when that came out, it was a tier four, you know? So I don't understand the process, but as far as Chicago goes, you know, I love Chicago very much. I spend half of my time between San Francisco and Chicago. Um, I was already there. I have a I have a decent treasure hunting map in Chicago. Um so I I have a thing where um I want to hit a number every month treasure hunting. And that number used to be um 330,000 upics. Every month I wanted to hit 330,000 upics and then um some months I could do that in like a week if you got like the right treasures, right? Um but then once I hit that number for the rest of the month, I go to Chicago and all I do is, is mine spark. I don't competitive hunt. I don't do any of that. I use all of my sends all day long and I look for spark. And that's how I've gotten to 24 spark, you know, is competitively hunting for it and hunting for it in spark week. Um, but I have a method to my madness and that's part of it. And I think Chicago, um, I think Chicago is, is a great city, but on a global scale, you know, Chicago is a big city in the U S but it's not like a destination city. I definitely wouldn't recommend it to people. There's, there's way better cities that I would recommend. So, you know, is, is Chicago on point with, where it stands in the world and the metaverse, I I think it's close, you know, a one, one, two, a one, one, three. I don't think there's, there's much of a difference. I know technically there is as far as send fees and stuff like that, but I don't think it's, I don't think we're talking about a lot of money here, you know, and, and I definitely don't think we're talking about a huge difference. We'll see what it looks like in five years. You know, Chicago could be demoted to a tier two once Miami, Philadelphia, San Diego, you know, all these other big, you know, Phoenix, you know, um, there's so many cities that have NFL teams that are not released yet. Who knows what we're going to see? You know, we could also see another demotion like Brooklyn. Brooklyn was a tier two. I had a ton of Brooklyn stuff and then it got demoted to a tier four. And then now it's a tier three. So I, I don't really care about the tier structure anymore. I care about either what it's going to produce for me, treasure hunting, what the yield is going to be on the property. And if it's good, I'll buy it there. Like, like I don't make decisions on tiers anymore. I used to, but I don't anymore. Absolutely. Um, let me ask you a, a question that may hit home a little bit more personal, but should there be term limits for people holding elected office 
within upland metaverse yes and i believe there are um for our counselors in portage park it's uh three months so um for the mayor it's six months so um you know, I think the Upland Metaverse Players Council, the UMPC, now they're called, I think they have term limits too. I think they set six month term limits or something like that. Um, I definitely think there are. And, um, you know, what I would like to see is I would like to see um, a number of term limits, right? So, you know, like you should only be able to be mayor so many times or you should only be able to be counselor so many times. However, um, we're not at that point yet, you know, like when, uh, when we first did the counselor, there was four people running for counselor. I don't think we've had like a situation where 16 people are trying to be counselor and only three get elected. Um, so as of right now, like we need people like myself or other individuals to continue to run, to keep this thing going. But yes, I would like to see it to be where, you know, you can only be a mayor for six months, but you can only do that three times. You know, you can do a, a total of 18 months as mayor, but then you got to either do something else. You could go be a counselor. You could be president. You could be you know, like, like you, you got to move up. You can go be treasurer. You can go do something like that. But, uh, you know, things need to grow and, and not that they can't grow under the guidance of the same person. Um, but as we know here in Upland, you know, it definitely takes a village and there's a lot of people out there that have good ideas. Um, and this is your chance, you know, like anybody in Upland, if you own a property in Portage Park, if you own a building in Portage Park, and if you have that building set as your primary residence, stating that you live in Portage Park in the game, you could be mayor of Portage Park. That's all you got to do is you got to own land and you got to uh, set it as your in-game home address and you qualify, you know, like it, it, it's not like, you know, being president of the U.S. where you have to be a certain age, you have to do all this. Other, like, you know, we have a very low threshold. And for a, a, a counselor, there's a lower threshold than that. You just have to own some land. You know, and, and it's a great way for anybody to, to speak their mind. And uh, I have an open door policy. Anybody has an idea, send it to me. I'll consider it or I'll bring it in front of the council. If they like it, they'll do it. And or if they like it, we'll figure out a way to implement it. That's a better way to say that. Um, but but yes, you know, term limits, a number of how many times you can do things. Yes, I, I think that that needs to continue to be a thing. Absolutely. Um, let's move on to the final section of this interview, Russell, which is rapid fire questions. Now, this cool. is my favorite section because I get to understand everyone's thought pattern. So here's the question. Why Upland? Why Upland? Well, I'll tell you a couple of things. Um, I really like Google Maps. You know, when Google Maps first came out, um, I was living in Portland, Oregon, and it was this new concept to where you could go and you could, um, you know, drop a little street view into somewhere and I could see what Tuscaloosa, Alabama looked like, or I could see what Cleveland, uh, Ohio looked like or whatever, you know, it's this great concept. Um, so I've always been into Google Maps. And when I first started playing Upland, um, that's kind of the way that I saw it was that it's like this large Google map with like little digital plots. Um, but another thing is I actually used to work for the national weather service. Um, well, I worked for a company that was a contractor of the national weather service. Um, but one of the things that we used to do was we used to track storms and we used to put that data on top of a Google map. So you could see like the storm moving across the country. And so Upland kind of looks that way um, of what I used to see every day when I used to work at that. So, you know, it kind of hit me on a personal level. It hit me on a look level, but then also, I mean, it was so inviting and I got in on it. I feel like on, you know, not the ground floor, but I'm, I'm definitely, 
um, I want to say I'm year two, right? There's some people that started in 2020 and then I started in 2021. So I'm not the, the most senior class, but my email when I started, it says, congratulations, you're in the beta version of Upland. So I like to tell people that I've been a part of this for a long time, but you know, like I've played other games. I've played Alien Worlds and I've played Earth 2 and, and I've done the Mars thing. And, you know, I really like the community of Upland. I really like the people that you get to talk to. And, you know, like now that there's more emphasis on starting Discord servers, you know, um, there's a there's a treasure hunting collective um, that is a group of just all of the top treasure hunters, we all communicate. We're all friends, you know, like there's friendly competitions and, you know, like we all help each other. We all trade properties to help make our maps better. I mean, you know, like there's so many things that Upland has that other uh, metaverses just don't have yet, you know, and other, other than that, it's not tied to a cryptocurrency. I can't argue how that is probably one of the best features of upland you know like if that cryptocurrency tanks you know what what you had a hundred thousand dollars now you've got seven that doesn't happen in upland you know whether the market goes up or goes down you still have the same amount of currency in upland and that's what i really like about it you know the central land is a great game you know alien world is great they're all tied to what it's uh uh, TLM is what uh, Alien World uses. It's called Trillium, you know, and like you can go earn a lot of that, but it's like it's worth four cents right now, you know, and like as we see, crypto markets are very volatile. I don't want something that I do to be tied to something like that. So I that's what I love Upland for like the most is that my money doesn't fluctuate. My money jingle jingles, that's for sure, but it doesn't uh, fluctuate in that sense, you know? Absolutely. What's the best city to treasure hunt in? The best city to treasure hunt in? Oh, man. Um, San Francisco, for sure, because it's a very small city and it's it's a peninsula. Three quarters of it is surrounded by water. So when it tells you that the arrow is far left, you can only go as far as the water. You can't send into the water where like when you hunt in other cities like Chicago, man, that map is so big, you know? So I, I would argue San Francisco is probably one of the best. And like, if you want a good tier two, um, I like Santa Clara. Santa Clara is a small town, but it's a tier two and it's got some great treasure hunting. Uh, I definitely like West coast treasure hunting the best. Uh, but East Coast in New York is not bad either. You know, the Bronx is is another great city um, to treasure hunt in. Absolutely. Uh, one feature suggestion you have for Upland? I have a thousand. Um, you know, first and foremost, I want to see um, the API tell me how many people are treasure hunting. Like it tells me 25, but I want to see who they are. I want to know when they are. Um, recently we saw changes in treasure hunting, like the cooldown period, right? When you win a treasure, you got to wait three hours before you can compete in another treasure. Um, recently in the, in the Turkey hunts that we just had, that was cut to an hour and you know, like that was big. I would argue that, that it should be treasure hunting cooldown should be based on how much UPX you win. If you win a lot, you should have to be on a longer cooldown than somebody who wins a smaller amount. You know, I want to see stuff like that. Um, but I also, I want to see changes. Uh, I have one about Portage Park where uh, we have a, a mayor's address. We have an address in Portage Park that is reserved for the mayor. If you are voted mayor, you get to set this as your in-game address and it's a point of pride and i want that to be recognized in upland i would like it to be the only property or one of the only properties in upland that you can no longer buy i want it taken off the market and you can only earn it by being trusted in the portage park community to be mayor stuff like that would be cool absolutely if you like the video please hit the like button if you think what's being discussed is nice and you'd like to join the discussion please comment below and if you'd like to stay updated please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon
Thank you. So when you're treasure hunting and the, he is questioning you on your strategy, do you prefer to slide into the treasure or do you prefer to send to the treasure when you're almost nearby? Um, so my strategy is my own and it is, it is what now what many people use. So, you know, treasure hunting used to be that you would send to your own property, right? So you would buy a web of properties scattered all over San Francisco. And then when there's a treasure hunt, it tells you like where the arrow is. And then you would send to a property and you would kind of triangulate for it. You'd kind of based on proximity, then, you know, I don't do that. My treasure hunting strategy is that I start from the same property every single time because I know those arrows pretty well. Um, but my goal is to land on the treasure. I'm not looking for it. I know where it is. Like when it says it's up and to the left, I have a pretty good idea based on the waves that the little treasures uh, hunting arrow makes, I'm trying to land on it, you know, and that's what we're seeing in treasure hunting now too, is why treasures are being found in 15 seconds. I can tell you why really easy. Look at all my fingertips, right? These are all the people treasure hunting. And when they are in San Francisco, they're all scattered out. Right. But as soon as treasure, uh, as soon as the arrow tells you, they all do this. They all go to the same area. And now you've got 18, 19, sometimes 50 people landing in the same radius of each other. Like you basically now have to land on top of the treasure to win it. There's no more like searching for it. There's no more sending five, six, seven times to go win it. You basically get three. You get three guesses. You get You start, you send to where you are. And then you hope you land in the red and then you hope you land on top of it. Like that's how fast it has to go. So, you know, I invented that strategy as far as like a lot of people didn't know that was a thing. So that's my strategy is that when I see the arrow, I'm trying to land on top of it. I'm trying to land next to it. I'm trying to land. I'm trying to hit the treasure in one send if I can. Absolutely. An underrated player that you want to give a shout out to in this interview who helps the community, but is not recognized enough and is not given the credit enough within the Upland community. There's so many. Um, one player, to, you know, first and foremost, I think that, um, you know, there, there's always people like thank me later and too stupid to win. Um, they do a lot and, even they would argue that that even though they're well known, they're not uh, well known. Um, so I always think that there's going to be people like that. But you know, like somebody who helped me really early on, um, his name is Verntar, V E R N T A R. Um, he's a treasure hunter in San Francisco. Um, we would uh beat each other to treasures and then one day i started reaching out to to verntar and we started talking and you know like now we're really good friends and we're both part of portage park we're both part of the the treasure hunting collective um but but he is also another individual who cares very much about the sanity of treasure hunting as much as i do you know we want to make sure it's fair we want to make sure it's a level playing field that nobody has a a distinct advantage, um, and and that is somebody that uh, that that does a very good job, and he's also very active in the analytic assassin room as well too. Absolutely, um, your favorite Upland community manager. My favorite Upland community manager. I mean, I'm always going to be partial to General Mort. I'm always going to be uh, partial to him because his name's General Mort. It makes me laugh. Um, however, you know, like what I, what I like about what Mort does for a lot of people is that you know he actually has a lot of conversations with us um, in the Treasure Hunting Collective. You know, like that's that's one of the things that the Upland Metaverse Player Council, the UMBC, 
that's what they set out to do. They wanted to create um, an alliance of people and anybody could come to them and then, you know, with an idea and then that group would pitch it to Upland, right? And that, like, that's what they wanted. They wanted to have Upland's ear. Um, we have that in the treasure uh, in, in the Treasure Hunters Collective. We actually have Squall Maza. He's another community manager. Um, Squall listens to us and we present data to him. He can take uh, that data to the actual devs and show them. And then, you know, like that's how we were able to bust so many people um, by, by showing real stuff. So, you know, Squall Maza and General Mort are, are probably two of my favorite, but Mort, just because he's he's funny, he actually does the Upland auctions. You know, he's a big part of that, but he's a big part of Upland, but he's very behind the scenes um, if you don't know, like, where to look for him. Absolutely. Um, when do you realistically expect 3D within Upland? And here's the thing. Even if it is restricted to just one neighborhood like Portage Park, when do you realistically expect 3D in Upland? I mean, technically speaking, we have 3D in Upland now. It's just part of a layer two that you have to go be a part of. You know, like actually 3D in the game. I mean, we have that now. Um, there's a setting in the game where it says show 3D objects and your buildings are 3D, the the lily towers, the assassins, courtyards, all these buildings, you know, they're all 3D. You know, you can argue that the the uh, the ornaments, the cars, they're all 3D. So we do have some 3D aspect. I think the the what you're looking at for is more of an interactive 3D where you put on maybe like a VR set or something. And I think that could be early as like the next few years. You know, I think that that could definitely be a thing where you grab a, like a, a pair of Oculus or even what is it now where like you put your phone on a pair of goggles and then it goes over your face, you know, like that stuff can be implemented um, pretty quickly. There's libraries and stuff out there for it now. So it, it could be short, but I think like realistically, I think it's going to be three or four years before that's like the norm, you know. Absolutely. Do you treasure hunt on your phone or your laptop? So this is my Google Pixel 6 Pro. This is what I treasure hunt on. Um, competitive hunts, I only hunt on my phone. Okay. I here's, only hunt on my phone. Here's a question then. And a lot of people who treasure hunt on mobile phones are against this. But a lot of people who treasure hunt on desktops or laptops are really in favor of this. Should there be shortcut hotkeys such, such as send or start treasure and things like that? You know, I think that those are okay. I think that that having you know having your own processes processes of of doing things, you know, like to to each their own, like. That's something we all can do, you know. Um, I I heard this one time. Uh, somebody said this. Uh, one of my really good friends, who is a professional car racer, um, his team introduced something that was brand new, that was never part of racing before. And you know, his argument was, "Why don't you do it as well? Instead of restricting me." Why don't you try to to join me? But now what he did is now it's such an industry standard. Like you wouldn't imagine racing without this thing that he proposed. So I think treasure shortcuts are okay. You know, like when you hit the shift key and then you scroll your mouse and it zooms you in really quick, that's all great. And, you know, if you want to hunt on a computer, yeah, you know, computers are going to have advantages over phones. But I have found many advantages that phones have over computers, and that is why I treasure hunt on my phone, um, first and foremost. But also, um, I think that that there are a lot of things in treasure hunting that should be removed, um, like as like you shouldn't be able to inspect the element 
and manipulate the JavaScript. Like that's actually a thing that you can do. Um, you can actually right click and you know the little send button in the bottom corner, like that little pawn. If you know how to edit CSS, you can make that button bigger. So then it's easier to click or your mouse doesn't have to scroll as far. So I do think that there are some things where um, stuff like that shouldn't be allowed, you know, more power to you if you know how to do it and you know how to get stuff like that. But I think that when it comes to treasure hunting, you know, there needs to be a better conversation about leveling the playing field because we're seeing people. I'm a great hunter. Arguably, I am in the top 30 of treasure hunting of all times as far as number of treasures found. I'm, I'm arguably at 97% of my treasures are all exclusives. A lot of people treasure hunt and they find the, the purple limiteds and those don't have a lot of, uh, they don't have a lot of UPX. Like arguably like 97% of my entire treasure hunting career are either rares in San Francisco or limited in San Francisco, or I'm sorry, uh, exclusives in San Francisco, um, which is something that a lot of people don't see anymore because treasure hunting has gotten more competitive. Um, but I would like to see a more level playing field, but I, I'm in favor of, of short keys or of, um, shortcuts, hot points, wh whatever you want to call them. But I do think that um, there are ways that anybody on a PC can manipulate the game in such a way that gives them an advantage. And I would like to see that gone, you know? Absolutely. Um, so let me ask you this question. We see a lot of property structures being built on Metaverse land within our games. Should there be a property structure that is a billboard and should that billboard then allow the player to lease it out to someone like Google Ads? You know, I think that I think that that should be something. Yes, yes. You know, I think that we see that in society today, right? Like, no matter where you are, there's always a billboard on the side of the freeway or. Um, you sit down on the train and, you know, you're given a book that's of nothing but of advertisements or even, you know, um, here in, in America, uh, um, on our grocery carts, when we go to the, the grocery store, some, there's a realtor's face on the shopping cart that I have to look at every time I go shopping. I mean, you know, advertising spaces everywhere. I don't think it's going to be effective right now in Upland because not a lot of people are viewing Upland in that 3D sense, you know, like not too, not too many people, including myself, I, I hardly look at the game in 3D, you know, like I turn all that stuff off when I'm competitive treasure hunting. Uh, when I build a building, yeah, I want to look at it, but I don't think that there's going to be use for it, but when, like we said earlier, if it's going to go 3D and if you can have a virtual experience, hell yeah. I think that instead of putting a property on there, you should be able to put a billboard and you should be able to put a bar or something there, you know, like you should be able to do something other than just a house. Let me ask you this short question then. Since you said that not everyone uses 3D, should the 3D property structure have a 2D twin? of that property structure that could be dynamic. I'm all about the idea that less is more, you know? So like, I, I don't want to, I, I would rather have a one good version of 3D instead of having five different options to view it because of, of preference or whatever, you know? Like I'd rather, I'd rather see the game get built in one great aspect instead of having two subpar ones so no i don't think that there should be a a 2d but i do think that you know it wouldn't be hard to have a marker of some sort to say that there is a property on top of it or something along those lines color it different wh whatever it is but i mean you know like honestly i would like to get rid of like the the meta venture stores like when i treasure hunt I don't want to click on one of those. And sometimes those are very close to my properties. So I can't like when I go to touch the little blue 
circle to touch my property. I end up touching the little orange circle and I send to a meta venture instead of the property I want. So I would argue that we should take some things out or I should be at least able to, to remove those from my view instead of, instead of this other proposal of like creating a, a, a 2d, 3d, 4d kind of a, of a world. You know, I, I think it should go a completely different direction. Absolutely. If you like the video, please hit the like button. If you think what's being discussed is nice and you'd like to join the discussion, please comment below. And if you'd like to stay updated, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. A celebrity you would uh, like to see in Upland? A celebrity that I would like to see in Upland. Um, I don't know how much of a celebrity it is. However, you know, um, a lot of this global scale stepping back, looking at like a a thirty thousand foot view, right? Cryptocurrency is becoming more and more accepted in everything. And I mean, like now they sponsor Formula One, they sponsor IndyCar, they sponsor NASCAR, they sponsor like a lot of racing. Um, there's a lot of people that I hang out with in the racing community that I would love to see in Upland because they have um, exchanges as their sponsor and stuff like that. So I would like to see um, more more people like that. But as far as like movie stars and stuff, I mean, I, I don't think that they would actually do it. Maybe it'd have to be somebody like like a, a smaller D-list comedian or something. That'd be pretty cool. But uh, as far as that, like... Auto racing is big right now. And it, you know, auto racing is like, as far as I see the future of Upland, as far as like what they're trying to do, I like to see them go after more, uh, more, more racing people. Absolutely. Um, a company you would like to see in Upland? Coca Cola, for sure. You know, um, Coca Cola is already doing a lot of great stuff in the Web3 space. Um, they're working with a lot of brands in Mexico. They're working with a lot of uh, things like that. You know, Coca Cola has been an innovator in so many things. And um, they actually own Coca Cola, actually does certain things that some companies can't do and they're like the only ones to do it so i would like to see coke come in only because of the the resources that they have the money they have and i would like to see like what kind of things that, that they could build you know absolutely is spark inflation real is spark inflation real <clears throat> yes yes definitely um <clears throat> how do you i think see, it's how, how do you see that getting solved it, it's already being kind of solved as it is now. I mean, you know, like um, <clears throat> there used to be riot mode for Spark Week. So, you know, instead of earning a small portion of Spark for your treasure hunting, you were basically doubling up. You know, there was Spark Week, um, the, the, the second Spark Week ever, which was in, I believe it was either November or December of 2021. Um, I brought in three and a half spark, you know, so somebody like myself, um, I mentioned earlier how people were creating profiles to sell them, you know, so there are tons of those profiles out there that have a tiny amount of spark. Um, but that's because they're all being operated by the same player and, I would argue that that player should either own all of that spark or that spark should be part of somebody who's actually using it. Like you said earlier, there's a lot of people that have, there's a lot of players in Upland that have, even if it's 0 0.001 spark, that's, that's still spark. That's either not being used or it was earned in a less traditional, uh, fashion and that shouldn't be the case and so you know one of the biggest things now is you can't collect spark unless you're kyc verified you know you can't treasure hunt for limit or for exclusives or rares unless you're kyc verified 
And I think now for Spark Week, you know, people like myself, I'm still earning one, one and a half Spark for Spark Week. I'm not seeing the three, four, five that I used to see, um, but I'll take one and a half all day long. You know, that's that's arguably seven hundred dollars or six hundred and thirty dollars or something like that that I'm bringing in. Um, But, you know, these treasure hunting changes that have appeared, you know, they, they are for the better. And I think that. You know, we're seeing the spark market drop um, as far as like people wanting to pay to rent spark. A lot of these exchanges are are barren anymore. Um, they're, they're not the numbers that we're seeing, but I do think that it's being combated. And I think that once buildings have more utility in them, uh, especially with cars, you know, I, I think cars are going to revive that too, where you need spark to charge your car in order to drive it. That's gonna that's gonna bring things back if if that's the route they choose to go. I'm I'm hoping that's the the route they choose to go. But you know, I, I think that it, it could bring it back. But it's definitely we're not seeing it to the days where it used to be, right? We're we're not seeing that anymore. Absolutely. Um, Russell, let me ask you this question because this has been a point of contention with my previous guests, and I sort of agree with them. Do you think with the whole 3D movement, and, and it's fine, we're working on 3D, it's a bit more difficult, it needs a lot more resources, right? But do you think when it comes to interior decor, especially uh, within the properties, as you rightly said, should we be allowed to essentially import pictures and videos, perhaps the 2D pictures and videos from your YouTube or your Instagram and create so, something like a personal gallery? So for instance, if someone comes to your house, you can then hang your picture from your Instagram or any of your, you could perhaps upload that or import that from these platforms and sort of create a welcome sort of lounge within your house. Uh, should that be something that should be done? Yeah. I mean, you know, Decentraland does that the best, right? Where like you can have a shop or you can have a, a house. And then what you can do is like, you can import an NFT and you can make that the floor. So, you know, like that's your carpet or that could be a decoration of a wall or you can hang it as a painting. So like, yeah, you know, I would like, that's, that's always what I envisioned when they mentioned meta ventures and stores. That's kind of what I envisioned of, you know, like I, I, I very much like the interface for what it is now. Um, but it's still just a shopping cart at the end of the day, or, you know, you're, you're shopping through a store, you add it to your cart, you check out. I mean, you, you know, like that, that's the basic fundamentals of it, but yeah, you know, like I would actually like to see, um, things where like, you know, we have specific, we have specific NFTs in Portage Park that you can only get for being in Portage Park. And those should be seen in houses in Portage Parks and it'd be cool to have a gallery and to charge in in an uh admission fee or something like that. Like it'd be really cool. And that like that'd be a small you that'd be an easy utility change, I feel like, to to bring in. Um I, yeah, you you know, or I always envision that as well too. Like when they first told us about football coming to um Upland, right? They were they said that there's going to be ways to interact with the players or stuff like that. And like, we haven't seen that. Like some of the players created profiles, but they haven't done anything with them. Like they're still just sitting dormant or what, whatever, you know, like, but I thought that there is, I bought a lot of properties around stadiums. Cause I thought my idea was going to be is like, you know, you have to be within a certain perimeter of the store in order to interact with it. And I thought it would make sense that if somebody wanted to go to the Kansas City store, that they could rent my property, like an Airbnb or a rental property, and then they could visit that store or they could watch the football game or something like that. But that's not what happened at all. So, I mean, like I lost a lot of money or or I lost a lot of potential revenue because I thought that was going to be a thing. Um, yes, like I would like to see it be that way. You should be able to go to the football stadiums, and interact with it. You should be able to go take a, a virtual walking tour of it. It'd be really cool. Like that's obviously going to need more detail stuff along those lines, but 
you know, it, it'd be really cool to, to, to see that. So Russell, let me ask you this. What's an international city that you want released? Um, an international city that I want to see in Upland. That that's a good one, you know. Um, I I want to see a a Tokyo, or I want to see some kind of Japan, um, because I think there is a a big player community base in Upland that isn't being talked about, right? Right, like. We know that once Rio came out, there's a big Brazilian presence. Some of the developers of the of Upland work in Brazil. They're they're Brazilian, you know that makes sense. But I would like to see you know either either part of Korea or or part of Japan or maybe even China, um, come in there. But I don't want to see that until maybe there's more things in the game to do because Tokyo there's so many things to do in Tokyo and like it's such an innovator of so many things like it'd kind of be a letdown if that city was there and like you can only do the same things that you can do in Chicago so I would like to see a city like that I'd, I'd like to see Tokyo or I'd like to see like um uh, uh Seoul South Korea like I, I'd like to see something like that you know like like that'd be pretty cool Absolutely. Um, let me ask you this question then. We saw Genesis Week happening in Vegas last year. This when uh, we saw, don't, we saw, don't even get me started on that. We saw Genesis Week happening in Vegas this year. A lot of international players were a little bit unhappy about that because it was announced a little bit last minute and most of them need a visa to come to U.S., right do you think that either it should be announced way in advance so people can make sure that they have their visas and can come to us to attend that or should it perhaps be done in a place that is a little bit more relaxed for people with visa conditions You know, Genesis Week is a sore, sore subject for me. Um, so I grew up in Nevada. Specifically, I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I lived in Nevada my entire life. And I, m me and my family, we made a decision to move away. Literally, the day that I got in the car to move away, they announced that Genesis Week is coming to Vegas. The day I left and said, hey, all my stuff is sold. We we sold our house. We sold our cars. We sold all of our stuff. So long town. They said, hey, it's coming here. And, you know, like I, I debated so much whether I should even go. Like I wanted to go because I wanted to meet everybody. But it would have been much easier to do had they told us five months ago or, or a few. Like, you know, in, in the WordPress community we hold events um and those are announced 7 8 months in advance not only Absolutely. um not only because it helps people plan but exactly. um it also it also gives more people time to register and stuff like that yes. um i also i also gave upland an earful because had they announced it earlier i was working at a casino I could have got them a deal on rooms we could have got them a better deal on the space we could have we could have made it more beneficial or or cheaper than it, it was to to do some of these things um and we could have made it all inclusive to where yes even though you, you know like that visa or or e any kind of uh passport you know is needed you know once you have that solved like any everything else would have would have been solved it was still a great event don't get me wrong but i too was somebody who got burned by that because it was so late. It was this thing where it was like, I want to go, but now that I live halfway across the country or, or three quarters of the way across the country, plane tickets aren't cheap anymore, you, you know? So it, it's like that, that one really burned me. I would like to see, I believe it's going to move. It's not going to be in Vegas every year, you know? Like I think Genesis week, we're going to see Miami, I think we're going to see 
San Diego. I think we're going to see Philadelphia, you know, like all, all these cities where um, football stadiums still need to come out in, you know, so I, I think it's going to be one of those, but I would eventually like to see Genesis week happen international. However, you know, it's not going to be in whatever new city is. It's it's going to have to be in Brazil or it's going to have to be in a, a, a Japan, a China. Cause there's a huge base in, there. You know, there's, there's not a huge player base in Turkey as there is in Korea, but could a Genesis week in Turkey happen for sure. You know, do you see that happening in Dubai or, or Israel? Because both of them have a huge Web3 and Metaverse community. I think Dubai is not only on the, the conversation. I think Dubai is, is arguably one of the cities that's probably being considered for agents this week. Right. Um, I, I, I do see in Israel, I do see a, I even see like a, a Budapest. I see hungry i see a lot of great cities you know where there are if upland's going to stay on the racing kick there's a lot of great formula one towns monaco is a great one right you know um you've got hungary where there's the hungarian ring you know you have spain you have italy you know like i would love to see any of those there and and it could be you know i would love to actually plan that as well i'd love to go to genesis week in rome or something like that but in order for us to do that yeah it's got to be announced way way in advance absolutely so i think what we agree is the clock sticking and Aplin should announce it quick it's okay if you don't have a plan, but it should be like, hey, March 18th, Vegas, this is happening. Cool. Great. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Or it's like, hey, we can't, we can't do it the 18th. Now it's changed the 20th. At least I have five months to where I can change my reservation or I can move my plane tickets around. Can't do that when it's 24 hours before the event. Absolutely. Russell, it's been an honor. I think I haven't even got halfway through the questions that I have for you <laughs> because you're such a personality uh, and you have such um, experiences and uh, opinions that you have, which I presume are shaped from your experiences. Uh, but I definitely think that we would be bringing you back for another episode. Um, with that, Please. Thank you. With that, uh, this concludes episode 18 of Reading Between the Lines with Tandaman. Russell, it was a great pleasure having you here. Thank you so much. Uh, please come follow me over on Twitter, twitter.com slash Russell Envy. It's probably all in the description below. Uh, that's where you can interact with me the most or come to Portage Park, join our Discord. And his YouTube is going to be linked in the description and the title of the video. Before I end this video, I will leave all my viewers with the one saying that I leave with them every time. You be the arbiter of truth, the viewers of the Metaverse Street Journal. Thank you, Russell. It was a great pleasure. If you like the video, please hit the like button. If you think what's being discussed is nice and you'd like to join the discussion, please comment below. And if you'd like to stay updated, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you.